Hi, this is Ken Lobb, Creative Director for Microsoft Studios, and you're listening to the Inner Circle Podcast. For the fans, by the fans. Welcome to the Inner Circle Podcast. I'm your host, KOR X Kalel, formerly known as KOR X Straight Murder, along with my team and panelists, B Money 101 and Unified. As some of you may know, we did a show with the box father, Phil Spencer, back in October, and from that, he made us realize the turnaround of the Xbox One platform was a team effort. So we wanted fans to know some of those team members, as well as bring you exclusive interviews and get your questions asked as it relates to the Xbox One platform and Xbox One exclusives. Starting with Mr. Ken Lobb, the legend himself. In February, we'll have Aaron Greenberg, head of first and third party marketing, Chris Caller, director of the ID at Xbox program in March, and Rainbow Six Siege devs possibly around April, June. We are in talks with many other devs and Xbox team members, so keep it locked and subscribe to the best Xbox One podcast on the net. Thank you to Mr. Phil Spencer for the support and official underscore Xbox underscore news on Instagram for helping Tick reach more gamers and expand our voice. And without further ado, here is our show. First and foremost, Ken, we want to thank you for giving us this opportunity and coming on the show. Uh, We really, really appreciate it. Um, We have so much to ask you, but before we do that, tell us how you got started in the game industry, from Nintendo to Microsoft, and out of the many games you've worked on, what are some of your favorites? Cool. Um, It's it's a long story, so I'll try and truncate. Um, uh, I went to school at DeVry in Phoenix, where I met my wife, and I was a hardcore skateboarder, but that's where I fell in love with video games. This is 1979 to 1982. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I got out of school in 82, and I knew I wanted to make games, but 1982 wasn't the best year to think about making games. Right. So I, I, I applied at Atari, actually, but didn't get in. I ended up working for AMD, uh, making ROMs, actually. And I worked as an engineer for about six and a half years, and I got lucky in 1988. I met a gentleman who was getting ready to form a small third-party licensee called Taxan USA Corporation. And that's when I got into the game industry. I worked on uh, some NES games, Logi Man, G.I. Joe, uh, Hokutuno Ken, Star Star Soldier, a few others. I was there about three and a half years. And uh, they actually closed down, but the parent company of Taxan is a company called Kagadenshi in Japan. It's a huge IC manufacturer, actually. Mm -hmm. And I got to know the president of uh, Kagadenshi, which is an honor. And one of his best friends happened to be uh, Nakamura Kaicho, the chairman of Namco. Mm. So he actually got me a job at Namco so that when when Taxan closed, my boss is like, oh, we're we're sorry, we're closing the studio. And I'm thinking, oh, God, i got to go be an engineer again. How boring. (laughs) And his next sentence is, oh, but you have a job at Namco. You should just – it's like two miles that way. You should go meet them. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, what? Wow. He's like, yeah, I met this vice president at CES that he had introduced me to, and I didn't know that that was an interview. So I work at Namco about three, three and a half years. And actually, when I was at Taxan, I met a guy named Tony Harmon who worked for Nintendo. And he had constantly tried to bring me to Nintendo, but Nintendo really wasn't doing uh, any development at the time. So I get a call from him in uh, 1993, summer. He's like, hey, I'm going to fly you and your family up. You know, we're going to hire you. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I love my job. The Namco's great. My wife's got a great job at National Semiconductor. Um, Yeah, I don't really want to move to the Pacific Northwest to not make games. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. You you know, you got to take it. Just consider a vacation, you know, see what we're doing. So he flies me up, and about this is about three months before the N64 is announced. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they show me the spec for the N64. He tells me they're going to form this group called the Treehouse, told me what he wanted me to do, and, you know, long story short, it's like my wife loved the area, a chance to work for Nintendo and make games. Now, that was a (laughs) a win-win. Yeah, and it's funny. When I uh, put my notice in at Namco, they're like, you can't leave. Where are you going? Nintendo. (laughs) Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of knew they weren't going to convince me to not go. Uh, I worked in, actually, it was only a few weeks after I worked at Nintendo that I, uh, on a trip to Japan, you know, went to NCL for the first time, met Mr. Miyamoto, met Mr. Takeda, and we had a meeting where Tim and Chris Stamper were there pitching the original Donkey Kong Country, and they had a fully playable level of pitching this to Miyamoto and Takeda. Literally, I'm sitting in the chair, like, twitching, sign this, sign this, sign this. <laughs> and so, like, my first real big job at Nintendo was to go buy all the hardware and software and help you know, Rare make Donkey Kong Country for the SNES. You know, meanwhile, we were building up the group to go and do N64 games. Wow. So, again, to shrink the story, nine years at Nintendo and many games later, uh, we were getting ready to launch the GameCube, and Mr. Arakawa retired. And I had, and still have, infinite respect for Mr. Arakawa. He was the president of Nintendo of America, of course. And I don't think I ever would have left if he had stayed there. But he retired. I wasn't... You know, I liked the GameCube plan, but I wasn't thrilled with it. And the reality was I was going home every night and playing Xbox. And a friend of mine calls me up from Microsoft and was like, hey, you should come over and meet Ed Freeze. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. And he's like, no, just just come meet. So I go to lunch with Ed Freeze. He tells me about a position that he's got uh, opening up. And uh, I decided to take the job, and I've been here ever since and been super happy. Uh, the second part of your question, of course, is what are – some of the favorite games I've worked on. Yeah, I've touched and worked on a lot, and so it's kind of hard to pick favorite babies, but mm -hmm. if I were to name a few, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention GoldenEye. Yeah, the clock. <laughs> um, Logi Man is one of the games I'm most proud of. It's the first game I designed from scratch, and for for your listeners that, that like old games, you can look at Logi Man, and there's some interesting things in that game. Uh, you could steal vehicles. It was the first game where you could steal a vehicle. But more importantly, <clears throat> it had three difficulty levels where features were added as you earned the harder difficulty levels. Mm -hmm. Basically, you unlocked secrets by beating the earlier levels and then played bigger levels that were harder. Wow. That's that's Goldeneye. That's you know, wow. it's also Last Core. It's also so a bunch of my games have that kind of. I like multiple difficulty levels, but I didn't like it when you just turned up hit points. I wanted you to be able to see new stuff and do new things, and so I, I, I kind of like the fact that I was able to drag these things that I came up with way back in, it was 1989 when I was designing Logi Man, and have it impact, you know, games all the way till today. Um, I'm, I'm proud of Crackdown uh, Fable 1, which I kind of helped Peter save. <laughs> Fable <laughs> was, oh, really? We didn't yeah. end up we didn't end up with planting acorns and turning them into giant oak trees, but, you know, that game was uh, going really, really well, but it was struggling in a couple areas, and it was in my studio. I applied a few of my designers to it, became pretty good friends with, with uh, Peter, um, so that one sits on the list. Hmm. Um, recently, uh, Sunset Overdrive I put on that list. Nice. Uh, you know, yeah. Sunset Overdrive, got to work with Insomniac. I've respected them forever. Um, I, I really love... The, some of the stuff we did in Sunset, you know, the fact that it probably has, um, again, just looking at my heritage, I love platforming. Mm -hmm. And platforming is a big part of Crackdown. I had influence on that. It was mostly Dave Jones and a guy here, Chris Novak, who built the game. Mm -hmm. But I was the, I want to jump, I want to jump, I want to jump. And, you know, when for, even today, if someone asked me what's really my favorite game of all time, I'll still call out uh, Crackdown 1. Right. And it's because of how great it feels to platform through that world. And Sunset's pretty damn close. You know, when, once you get all the abilities in Sunset, your ability to kind of... It, it's funny because I'm watching the Yoshi Island speedrun right now as we're talking. <laughs> the fly through the level uh, in both Crackdown and Sunset based on, you know, designed precise distances and right. capabilities... The, the capabilities of the character are really mapped into the level design. Those are the kind of games I like the best. Mm. I've got a bunch of other ones. We were, I worked on PGR. I worked on Geometry Wars. Um, at, at Namco, uh, I worked on uh, Rolling Thunder 2, which is probably one of my favorite like old-school 2D stealth shooters. Mm -hmm. um, Perfect Dark, obviously. Blast Core was another one that I really enjoyed. You know, helping Rare make, conquer, the list goes on and on and on. Wow. Uh, I would add to that, I'm super excited about some of the games we're going to talk about today. Oh, wow. Uh, clearly, to close, uh, 
one of my all-time favorite games to work on was Killer Instinct, both 1, 2, and the new one. And it's it's brilliant to be able to walk down the hall and work with Adam Ice Green on, you know, where we take uh, Killer Instinct Season 2, the, how we drove into Season 1, etc. So that's a very long answer, I'm sorry, but uh, it's... I've been doing this for 27 years, so it's hard to make make it a shorter story. <laughs> oh no, that was okay, that, that was amazing. Yeah, we enjoyed it. We enjoyed all that. Yeah, there was no Mr. Thunder. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was a great story, man. I, I, you know, you just goes to show the pedigree that Microsoft has. And um, you're an excellent dev, man. We all know you. All the all the fans know you. All the rare fans. All the Microsoft fans. We love what you've done um, for gaming. You you brought a lot to gaming. Really, happy. thanks. Yeah, it's I, yeah, I I do consider myself super lucky. I have a I have a hobby, and they kind of call it my job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, wow. I play games at home. I play games when I travel. I play games all the time. And you know, uh, as I've said to lots of my friends, the favorite games I love to play are the ones that aren't done because I can have impact. Right. And I get to do that. It's my job. It's 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 an honor. Well, you're definitely a game industry icon, that's for sure, man. So. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Well, you know, speaking of Killer Instinct, which is one of my favorite games of all time growing up on the SNES, it was awesome that that game came with a music CD, by the way. Whoever thought of that was a genius. <laughs> just just was a genius. Um, I think early on, people questioned Chaos Pay Model. They questioned the initial devs chosen and even some of the player designs. Yet, it's been a smashing success on the Xbox One and a successful revival of the franchise. And with that said, fans want to know, do you see Killer Instinct continuing to grow for the entire life cycle of the Xbox One? Have you in Iron Galaxy thought about recreating the original KI stages? Will Fatalities make a return in Season 3? And in light of the Street Fighter V being exclusive, diehard fans like Raymond Franklin want Microsoft to market KI beyond Xbox One, like on Primetime TV. Is is that in the plans? Okay, so that's a multi-part question, but I'll answer each part. Mm-hmm. Um, fighting games are great, and, and I'm, I'm a huge fighting game fan. I have I have just mountains of respect for the fight game community. You know, I, I, I got to go to Evo this year, go on stage, give the award for, for uh, the winner of KI, and... I was a kid in the candy store. I mean, I have so much respect for uh, just the fans that love fighting games, and it's great to be able to help build something that they can love as much as I do. Mm -hmm. Um, When you think about what have fighting games been, there's there's nothing wrong with it, but the idea that you release a fighting game and then change it a little and release it again felt like something that maybe we could try and do differently with Killer Instinct. That's where the idea came from of, hey, what if we were to make multiple seasons, and instead of releasing them as different games, they add. So you start with season one, and it's got the uh, eight plus, you know, boss, you got nine characters, and what if season two just added to that? And what if you could buy it and not, you know, again, if I think about the way I play Street Fighter, the way I play uh, Soul Calibur, Tekken, I tend to use a couple characters, Mm -hmm. not the whole suite. So we, we thought you know, it might be radical, but what if you could just buy Jago? And if you just bought Jago, you could still play against anybody online, you know, using any character. And then maybe over time, if you fell in love with the game, you could buy more of it or you could buy all of it. If you didn't buy anything else except Jago, what would happen in Season 2? Maybe you could still fight against the new Season 2 characters, etc., etc., etc. This is the kind of thinking that drove us towards... Uh, going after building Killer Instinct the way we did. Hmm. You add to that the fact that we started late. You know, you sh- should start anything that we were trying to hit with launch should start two years in advance. We started about a year in advance. Hmm. And so a secondary conversation came up of, you know, we could ship this when it's, I mean, not to say it wrong, but we could ship it when it's half done. Especially with a fighting game where balance and community feedback around features and balance are so important it's a cool idea to maybe ship it with, say, five or six characters done, finish off the other characters, and while you're doing that, uh, take consumer feedback for how we would balance the rest of the season. Um, Then once it's all done, while we're making season two, we can do a rebalance pass of season one, and this is what we've done. Of course, in the middle, we had the small hiccup of uh, 
my friends down the block decided to acquire Double Helix. <laughs> and, you know, I, don't, I don't hold any grudge. I, I'm a big Amazon.com shopper, and I love my Kindle. So, you know, I understand that these things happen. Uh, the funny story is when we were out looking for developers for the original Killer Instinct, um, nothing against Double Helix, but the first choice was Iron Galaxy. Right. And, uh, and Dave was like, hell yeah, we'll do it. Hell yeah. When do you want us to start? Well, now? Oh, uh, can we start in like six months? And we're like, you know, we kind of need to start now. So that's where we, we went to Double Helix. And again, just being open and honest, because that's what I like to do. When Adam <laughs> first came to me with, hey, we're going to use Double Helix, or we're thinking about using Double Helix, I'm, you know, my first response was kind of, are, are you kidding? <laughs> developers, and those developers had given us back pitches. And what happened was Double Helix didn't give us a pitch. They gave us a playable. They took Jago in, into their engine in a white box, you know, no texture, no nothing, but they gave us a playable demo. Mm-hmm. And they, they sent us this, literally it was a title thing, handwritten, called A Love Letter to Killer Instinct. Mm. And basically you had a studio that absolutely loved Killer Instinct, and they were kind of, please, please let us make this. We promise we'll do it justice. Come down and see us, you know, give us a test, et cetera, and here's a playable. And I was I was floored. You know, I, once I saw all that, I'm like, yeah, okay, I understand why you're bringing us Double Helix. And like all games, if it doesn't work out, we can kill it. You know, <laughs> it's the reality. Yeah, you know? right. And there wasn't anybody it else available at that, in that short couple-month window when we wanted to start. So it was like, okay, let's go for it. After the acquisition, of course, the first thing we did was call uh, Dave Lang and the guys at Iron Galaxy. And they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> well, just, <laughs> they jumped all over that. <laughs> yeah, and it, it did have a slight impact on the number of characters that we could launch at, at the beginning of Season 2. Mm-hmm. And we had debated back and forth, and did we wait till February when we'll have six? And we decided, no. No, we might as well, let's just put it out as early, quote, not, not necessarily early access, you know, because that, that now has a, a, a somewhat different meaning. Right. Because right. obviously when we shipped Combo and Maya, they were done. And, you know, now we've got Conra, Riptor, and we're leading up to the next character's release, so we can talk about it in a second. Uh-huh. To the second question, um, uh, we love marketing on television. We, we spend a lot of it on some of our games. Um, uh, Master Chief or uh, obviously Sunset had a big TV push. Uh-huh. But I, I believe that the reality is that um, the reason that people buy games has changed dramatically. You know, it's, and if anything, in the past, you could say, um, and again, marketing slang, but a lot, a lot of times a TV commercial is just for what's called a call to action. Mm-hmm. It's to try and get someone to go realize the thing exists and go buy it. The reality is what's happened now is any information from anywhere is the call to action to go look for more information anywhere. And some of the best assets are, are honestly, it's guys like you, it's Twitch, it's YouTube, and the, the Xbox platform itself, with its ability to link you to Twitch, to show you things from upload, to help you understand what your friends are doing, are arguably as powerful or more powerful than, than even just straight-up television. Mm-hmm. Um, we've sold, and more importantly, a lot of people have played because of the free rotating character. Like, millions of people have played Killer Instinct. Wow. And, and I don't know if that would change if we decided to put it on television. It might It'd be a great idea. I'd love it. I wouldn't complain if they said, hey, let's do television. But I don't think we need it. I mean, all you got to do is look at the Xbox Dash, and you can see that on the free category, which is kind of a strange category because Killer Instinct's not really a traditional free-to-play game, mm-hmm. KI has been number one pretty much since launch. Wow. Wow. In, in our store. And so lots of people go get it all the time. Lots of people decide to buy it. Lots of people decide to buy one character, buy one season, buy both by the ultra packs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it, it feels like, although TV would be awesome right now, it's like, but we're getting the attention where I believe it's way more actionable nowadays, which is people playing at Evo or people streaming tournaments or people, you know, on YouTube doing let's plays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I personally don't, I personally don't see the TV thing being that big of a deal, but for me, I think retail releases would be, would make sense for the killer. Instinct Absolutely. Games. And we did a retail release of season one, and yeah. we'll again do whatever makes sense when we get to finished with season two. It's probably yeah. some sort of bundled one and two. 
it all depends on you know how season one continues to sell at retail and uh, et cetera. But yeah, I, I have one sitting here, even though of course I've been playing digital forever, just because like a lot of fans, <laughs> I want to own the box, you know, <laughs> right? To keep my the stuff I worked on, especially you know sealed if at all possible. So in my office, I have my nice sealed Ki uh, new sitting next to my Ki Gold and Ki SNES. You know, and a few of the other games I worked on. I didn't forget to mention one of the other games that I really liked working on that didn't necessarily sell as well as some of the others, but was uh, Tetrisphere. Uh, that was a fun game to build. I got to work with Alexi. I- I'm super proud with the way the multiplayer turned out. And anyway, side conversation. I'll let you get to your next question. Yeah. And um, thank you, Franklin, for your question. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I just think that the, the, the KI community uh, wants it to be marketed next to Master Chief wants it to be marketed next to Gears, you know, they're real passionate about Killer Instinct, and they, they love the direction that it's going, and they talk to Iron Galaxy, they have these forums and things, but I think they just wanted to see it up there, not just an arcade game, you know? See it, see it, get, see it get a little bit of commercial play. Yep, yeah, and again, I, I respect and love the fact that people are asking for that, but, you know, again, and not to turn this around, but I, I really can't say it enough. The voice of the fans is the most important marketing in the kind of modern video game industry. Right. Oh, is there to kind of help the fans start the discussion. Mm-hmm. And we already have a huge discussion going on around Killer Instinct. Very quickly, have you guys thought about recreating the original stages? Well, they're actually kind of in there. You can unlock the ones that you can put kind of pasted into the background of the uh, practice level, including mm-hmm. the original music. Mm-hmm. Um, we have talked about it on and off, but but they were kind of simple. You know, and they, were they were simple. Pretty, I do I, remember that. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're in there. If you buy the KI Ultimate, of course, we have the emulation uh, of KI 1 and 2 with KI 2 playable on live. Right. So you, it's they're there. There are the original backgrounds. I, I've... I loved what Double Helix did, and Iron Galaxy is doing a phenomenal job with the new backgrounds, so no complaints. Uh, I didn't answer the question, sorry, about the um, fatalities. Mm-hmm. Uh, fatalities in the original Killer Instinct were arguably a little too comedic. It was. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, I think people would love that. Riptar, yeah, man, people. But that's, yeah, that's Rick, just uniqueness. Yeah, TJ Combo's <laughs> car. Yeah, that's, I, I also enjoyed. I also enjoyed humiliation. <laughs> And we couldn't get the humiliations into KI2 Arcade because the team, you know, they were a kind of a fun thing. We did really late at night one night while we were working on the original KI Arcade, you know, did some dance moves in motion capture mm-hmm. and decided to put them in as the humiliations. I love the humiliations. I, I bring those back. But but like a lot of our games, um, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about what we do and don't do with our games. Mm-hmm. But the reality is I don't tell the people that work for me, what to do. I have right. passionate discussions about what I think they should be doing. Right. And so it's like, yeah, I think we should have humiliations. And then, eh, no, those are silly. Okay. You know, <laughs> we're like, we can have this type of juggling. Okay, we'll do that. You know, and we have these nice discussions about, um, you know, every game I've ever worked on, I have that, that uh, philosophy that we hire great developers because they build great things. We don't tell them exactly what to build. And even with Killer Instinct, we started out with a with a pretty strong spec for what we wanted the season one game to be. Mm-hmm. But W Helix had a lot of great ideas, and you know Mike Zemont worked on that stuff as well. And and it's like, okay, you guys, I I now trust you. I trust you, Adam Eisgreen, and the team inside Microsoft, and I trust W Helix and now Iron Galaxy to kind of carry the court torch. They're the ones that work on the game every day. I play it every other day. But I'm not, you know, in the code, you know, in a motion capture stage, et cetera, et cetera. So I have to trust the teams, and I give them advice, but I always start my with advice with, hey, I'm going to give you a bunch of passionate advice. Please don't take it as mandate. Just do what you think is smart. Let's debate about the stuff you think might make sense, and, you know, please tell me I'm wrong if you think uh, some of my ideas aren't right. I'm, no one is perfect, right? Right. <clears throat> That's right. Since we're on the subject of revivals, there has been rumors of the games like Banjo Kazooie, Vivid Pinata, possibly being worked on, and a trademark renewal for Battletoads. With these platforming and beat 'em up franchises, Xbox One could be the best console to compete with likes of Nintendo in that space. 
As a gamer and dev, what franchises from the Xbox portfolio and from Rare's catalog would you like to see revived? And without giving away the goods, are there more old franchises in the works? Because fans would love to see new Jet Force Gemini or even Blast Force as a cloud compute based game with destruction physics. Yeah. So would I. Good idea. <laughs> anyway, to answer the to answer the question, um, this is one of the things that I you know love about Phil, and you know he he understands the value of IP not just in terms of let's go make a new one every year, but in terms of let's go think about the portfolio and what makes the most sense at the right time. But then you need to wrap that with what's the developer actually want to go build this year. What are they passionate about? Because, again, the best games come from teams that really want to build something. So uh, will there ever be another Banjo, Viva, Blast Core, Battletoads? Yeah, someday. And I think the reason you see things like Battletoads revived is because we know there's value. Mm. So we were the trademark. And, you know, does that mean it's coming this year? No. You know, does that mean it'll never come? Absolutely not. We have a lot of passion internally for each of the games that you mentioned. And, you know, we have surprises in store you know, in the near and long future. But understand that what it's really about is we want to build this uh, suite of IP that we can add to a list of let's build some new things, let's build some recent sequels, and let's do some crazy stuff like dig back into a portfolio of IP and build some games that people love. You know, so it's uh, they're, they're, I think the best message to give to your listeners is that we, we love the old IP as much as you do, and Please be patient because we can only build so much at a time. But yeah, we you you, you named a good list of games that we care about as much as you guys do. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, we get a lot of fans asking for Jet Force Gemini a lot. <laughs> People yeah, love rare. The tribals. They probably don't want the tribals to come back. You know? no, <laughs> pr- find the eight trillion tribals in that game was a little annoying. The rest of the game was incredible. Mm-hmm. I'm also a big Jet Force fan. Yeah, as I as am I, I'm a huge fan of that franchise. Yeah, I know Brandon's a big rare guy himself. Yeah, huge huge rare fan. You know, I'm I'm loving all the rumblings uh, that we're hearing from from Rod Beanley. Um, you know, he's, he's putting out some uh, cryptic uh, tweets yeah. lately, yeah. so I can't wait to see what's re- uh, revealed, man. It's a nice big year for rare, and I'm excited as well. Yeah, Ken, last year at Gamescom. Phil Spencer obviously dropped a huge bombshell when he announced Rise of the Tomb Raider was coming exclusively to Xbox 360 and Xbox One for holiday 2015. However, it's only a timed exclusive, and we will likely see it hit other platforms eventually. But you guys do have an exclusive franchise with a female lead character in dire need of a makeover. I bet you can guess what that might be. With that being said, we want to know, will we see a new Perfect Dark on Xbox One? And have you and the team considered making Perfect Dark a franchise similar to, say, a Tomb Raider or Uncharted? Think a third-person action adventure with a futuristic setting, kind of like a mix between Tomb Raider and Deus Ex. So I'd answer this one the same way I answered the last one. And, yeah, we love Joanna as much as you do. I think Joanna Dark is especially close to uh, for me because you know she was the unnamed sequel to GoldenEye. And, you know, I oh, yeah. you that, you know, the Perfect Dark on the N64 was a better GoldenEye, especially for multiplayer. Um, and I liked PDZ. It had some issues with the one-player game, but, man, the multiplayer was fun. Uh, the, what's, what's interesting about this question, uh, and although I, I, I will say I can't, uh, I can say today no one's working on a new Perfect Dark. Oh, uh, man. So I, would, oh. Uh, I would not like to disappoint the fans by teasing you with maybe... <laughs> but uh, Joanna is, I would call Perfect Dark, how would I put this? We have these discussions all the time about, hey, what should we bring back? Perfect Dark and Joanna Dark is in that discussion a lot. Mm. And and what's funny is the way you mention it is the way we often talk about it. Mm. It's like a world where you have Halo and you have Gears, having another Perfect Dark Zero style game maybe makes a little bit less sense than something that's a little more story-driven around Joanna, whether that's third-person, stealth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah, we, we like the IP. 
not just the IP of first person shooter, kind of like GoldenEye, but with the female spy in 2020. Mm-hmm. But the funny thing is that game was set in 2020, and you know maybe we'll see another Joanna Dark game before 2020. I can, I can do that. <laughs> uh, you guys, can. but that would be an interesting year to bring her back. You know, <laughs> we can't get it till then. You know, I'm not <laughs> sure that game actually took place in the first time. But yeah, it's uh, uh, again. Thanks for the call out. Um, it, it's funny you mentioned some of these games, and when Perfect Dark or, or Blast Core or Jet Force gets mentioned, uh, my memory immediately floats back to Manor Farmhouse and all the visits I made to Rare and all the hours working late building games that I love. So it's it's also a kind of a nice chance for me to reminisce when you ask these kind of questions. Yeah, I mean we we love those games. You know, the fans love those games. We're just looking for them to be revived in a next gen setting, you know, to to because, you know, people a lot of people try to consider Xbox the shooter box. And um, you know, we want to be as diverse a platform as any. And you know, we love our RPGs and things like that, but we also feel like Joanna she doesn't need another first person. We don't need another first person yeah. game, I guess you could say. Um, yes, and I think that an adventure game with her as a lead character would be kind of awesome. I think a lot of people feel that way. It makes total sense. Yeah, cool. I, I don't think yeah. a lot of people know the story of Joanna. You know what I mean? Because most of the time it's just run and shoot. Uh, mm-hmm. You really don't get the background uh, story of Joanna. So to to get a deeper story, um, kind of like how Tomb Raider right. uh, gave us a story, would, would, would be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, now it's time for the main course. You guys announced Phantom Dust at E3 2014, and for many of us, we had no idea what the hype was about about, about this OG Xbox non-US release game. Um, we've had tidbits and seen talks, but really want to understand why we should be excited for Phantom Dust. What is Phantom Dust, and why bring this game back? Will there be a single player campaign or some type of co-op being what we know so far sounds mostly like a PvP arena? Um, have you guys found a developer for it and will we see it released sometime this year? No dates, just saw you guys aiming for a 2015 release. So the last part of the question I might have to skirt around a bit, but I'll start on the beginning part. Oh, come on, right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a developer that we've been working on since before the announce. We wouldn't have announced it without uh, having a developer. We don't want to announce today who the developer is. Oh. Um, the why question is a, is a one that I feel very passionately about. Uh, I was here when Phantom Dust was being worked on in Japan, and <clears throat> let's just say that... Uh, leadership and Ken didn't see completely eye to eye. Mm. I, that game, from a design perspective, I felt was way ahead of its time. I, I, there are there are listeners and there were people that watched the press conference when I got up on stage that were, huh? What the heck is that? And others were like, oh my gosh, they finally, you know, they have a brain. Mm. It was a, it's a, a trading card game based arena combat game. You could kind of think of it like a really, really deep uh, Power Stone, hmm. but it had a full-on JRPG to unlock the cards. Hmm. It had one really big flaw. Uh, if you started playing this game, you had no idea it was an arena game until you played three to six hours, depending on how fast you went, because it kind of told the story before it opened up the fact that you were going to be fighting using these decks of cards. Yeah, I felt um, like that. Yeah, and so we want to fix that. We want to, you know, tell the story better, but but at the core of why Phantom Dust, it's because this game was better than it was rated. It's way better than than it was treated, mm. is maybe, except for the people that really deeply got into it. It goes back to the conversation you were asking about bringing back old IP. Mm-hmm. And it's another one of the things that I absolutely love about Phil. When Phil's thinking, you know, and coming to us about, hey, old IP, what should we bring back? He's not just saying, hey, what game that sold many millions of units could we bring back and maybe sell many millions of units again? Mm-hmm. What, he's, what he's really asking, because IP is more than just story character, it's also gameplay. Right. right. And so here's this game that had some pretty revolutionary things for its time. In fact, I, you know, we, we play the game a lot, uh, especially as we were going into last year's decision, and it's a blast. And it's like, there's, quote, IP wrapped up in the fun that is Phantom Dust. 
And it's like, that's why you bring this back. It's a game that not enough people got to see, you know, and, mm. and if there's things that we can do to help people understand, you know, that it's, it's kind of exactly to your point. Hey, we're first person shooter box. No, there's a lot of fun to be had on the box already. <laughs> and let's continue to broaden that. Let's, let's bring some things that are, in this case, very competitive. I think it's an interesting uh, case study to see how the fighting game community takes to Phantom Dust because mm -hmm. it's strategically really deep, both in how, you know, what deck you bring to fight, but also in terms of, you know, once you've got your deck, it's a strategic fighting game and uh, uh, use of space. The, the, the environments were actually partially destructible. That had an impact on how you played uh, any particular fight. Um, it was fun with two players and got more deep with four. Mm. Uh, there's a lot to that game that that deserves to be played by more people. That's why Phantom Dust. Um, okay. In terms of dates, one of the, again, I'll just I can continue to say the same thing over and over again, but it's true. One of the things I like working about uh, about working at Microsoft is we don't don't tell this to our developers. <laughs> <laughs> when we sign our game, of course, the contract has a date. You know, you can't write a contract without having a date when you're going to try and ship. But we don't really consider a game having a ship date until it's further on in development and we start to know the ship date. Mm -hmm. And we're still trying some things with, with Phantom Dust. And so with that in mind, all I can say is it may or may not be 2015. That's why I don't want to give it the date because we're not at the point in development where we typically decide is this game going to be in this particular month or in this quarter. And again, as you, you know, uh, um, you've heard from us earlier, uh, we've got a we got a great portfolio this year, and you know the last thing I'd like to do is take a game that's that good and dump it next to like Guardians. Right. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. It wouldn't be fair to, to Phantom Dust to do that. Right. So yeah, that's that's why the date answer I think is kind of great. So so the whole game is just uh, uh, PvP. No 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 it's a it's a JRPG right it's a, this game's about a thirty hour RPG. Wow. And then so you. There... Okay. Yeah, through that, you unlock the cards. And again, one of the problems of the original, and again, this isn't something we've landed on yet. It's, I'm going to give you another kind of gray answer. Mm -hmm. We know that, that we want people playing PvP before six hours. And we want them to have viable decks without having to wait 15 hours. Right. All right. So a lot of the discussion is around how do we front load a little of the uh, multiplayer side without breaking the beautiful unlock that was already so well designed in the original RPG. And again, we want to tell that story again because it's really good. You now, know, with, with obviously uh, with modernized because it's, you know, it was a, it was JRPG. <laughs> right, right. So I guess basically, you, do you still keep the same premise like it's the dust that's making these people get these powers, the yeah, cloud yeah, storms and stuff? The same schools and the same characters. Again, we want to retell the story better. It's a, I, I don't like the name reboot because you could look at KI and go, well, that's a reboot. And it's like, yeah, but you changed it really dramatically. Right. Right. Or reimagining is maybe a better way to think about it. But the story was one of the strengths of the game. Mm. So I don't want to not tell that story because, again, only like 60,000 people ever saw it. I don't know how many of them even finished it. Right. Yeah, I, I actually played the game. Um, yeah. Uh, being someone who played the game, so you are, you are going to mainstream it more, right? So it does reach yeah. more people. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we I want to. It's coolness, but we want to help people see that coolness <laughs> right right it was so probably a similar a, a similar uh i guess you could say uh sell point like killer instinct in some type of way uh how we sell the game is also still up in the air but yeah it's another one of these part of the reason that ki was done the way it was um and I, I, maybe i should have answered this in the previous question but the fighting game community has oscillated over the years. The mm -hmm. number of people that play fighting games is sometimes big, and it's sometimes huge, and it's sometimes slightly less than big. But the reality is, tens of millions of people have played fighting games in their in their you know game career, mm -hmm. and yet they might not want to just go out and take a sixty dollar risk. So another reason that we sold Ki the way we did is that we could is then a player that maybe is like, yeah, I used to like fighting games, and I played that Killer Instinct thing. Oh, I can go play a character for free, <laughs> you know, to see, if, to see if I like that, and then I can decide if I want to just buy that character, or you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we do think that that model makes sense with Phantom Dust, but we haven't decided exactly how we would do that yet. 
Gotcha. Okay, okay. So just to be clear, you are shooting for single player and multiplayer? Oh, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yes. It, it wouldn't be Phantom Dust if it didn't have the RPG. That's awesome. That's awesome news. Yeah. Uh, you know, for many of us, finding out that Microsoft Game Studios and Platinum Games are working together on what seems like an open world Monster Hunter S game with Dragon Companions was absolutely incredible. I mean, that's just that's just amazing for me. I'm a big RPG fan, so I'm really hyped about this game. And and though the trailer left us with so many questions, I know this is to be expected to be a big franchise for Xbox One. And I know you're limited on answers, but having been you know, haven't been helping with the game. What can you tell us about Scalebound? Is it a Monster Hunter S type game? Is it open world? Um, will will gamers get their own individual dra individual dragons? Will we see Scalebound gameplay this year, possibly at E3? Okay, so I'm going to start this answer with a little bit of backstory. Um, again, I've been making games for a long time. I've worked with. I won't say every great developer in the world, but I've been able to work with most of them. And it's it's one of the things that I treasure the most in my job is that I get to go meet these people that, that I have huge respect for. Be, become their friends if, if that's something that works out. Work with them and build a game in many cases. And Platinum was right at the top of that list. I wanted to work with them forever. Mm. And I was... Uh, Lucky enough to help make that happen. About two years ago, we met with them, met, uh, and 54-year-old Ken sometimes forgets. It was, <laughs> I think it was TGS that year, but it might have been E3. And we met, I'm pretty sure we met at both. We met kind of casually at E3, and then we had a, a, a formal meeting at TGS two years ago. And uh, that that was when they pitched the game to us, and, and one of the things that they had asked was, you know, they make these games that are 90 rated awesome. They're awesome games. Mm -hmm. But they've struggled to sell huge quantities worldwide. And they, they're they very self-aware. They understand that this is a mixture of uh, good marketing, good PR, but also, you know, their understanding of the Western audience. Mm -hmm. And so it's been just phenomenal working with them. Their Kamiya-san is such a genius. I mean, the, the guy is a fantastic designer. And... But, and yet they're also, they love the fact that we like to use your research. We like to show, you know, stuff to consumers to get their feedback on, hey, this type of look, this kind of gameplay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been uh, uh, quite um, insistent, might be the good word, of getting as much time as they possibly can right. with designers and with uh, our ability to do, to do UR, uh, et cetera. And, you know, again, I, I just couldn't be any happier. It's like... Again, I, I'm, yeah, working with so many great developers and adding to Platinum to that list just makes me kind of grin silly. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of game it is, we haven't announced. So I can't really say, but uh. I, can hint, I can hint. It's, of course, it's you, and there's dragons. And, you know, yes, <laughs> your, your question nailed it, right? <laughs> Again, so without telling you anything, I can say, it, yeah, uh, Monster Hunter asked, no, Monster Hunter is kind of weird and grindy, and I like it, but no. Uh, you have to think, what does Platinum do well? That's what they're building. And okay. what do we do well? That's what we're adding. And yes, these are Dragon Companions. Okay. So it's, you know, you, and they are, God, they're awesome. I mean, and yes, you will be able to see, and it definitely will have people playing uh, later this year. Yes. I don't want to E3 playable on the floor. I, that would be silly. I can't. Again, we, we've just barely started E3 planning, so right. what, how, and when, and but I, I, I walk down the hall and I play a lot, mm. so the, the scale bound is very real, very awesome, and I think when people really understand what it is we're building, they're going to be shocked. I mean, it is definitely a big AAA, what happens when you take the best of what studios can do and use that to help what I think is, you know, what Edge this year called the best developer in the world, you know, with mm -hmm. Platinum, is uh, please be excited. It's it's an amazing... I think they have an opportunity to make, you know, the game of the all time, as lots of people like to call really? it. Really? Is that, yeah. is that special? Yeah, it's wow. special. It is special. Wow. Wow. If I was a bet, man, I, I bet we're going to see it at E3, so... 
<laughs> yeah, no, he. I mean, we're definitely going to see it at E3, I think. I think you can't let that game not be shown at E3. Um, the fans would go mad if we didn't see that E3. But, um, man, I, I always imagined this game being like, when I saw that first preview of you riding, like the character's riding a dragon, and he's in the sky, and then you see the other guys jump in with him, you knew right then and there that it had some type of co-op multiplayer aspect to it, and then they're fighting this giant monster. So that's why I got the Monster hunter S type game. But then I'm like, well, if you're flying... This has to be like a giant space, like a giant world. You can't just like be flying in like a, a, a linear area, you know? So that's why I think it's an open world game uh, with all the action of like a Devil May Cry, except you have this dragon companion with you. <sighs> not, really good guess. And again, I would add to that with... Uh, um, um, I, I love all games, something I haven't been able to say yet on this podcast. I own every system... I play the best games on all platforms. I am very uh, console agnostic. Of course, I love Xbox and I love my gamer score and I love my friends list and and I love you know Sunset Overdrive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But I, God, I love Bayo two. You know, and you can I think you can look at Bayo two and see the type of you know game that Platinum is great at making. But you can also look at it and understand, you know, it's got some Western blockers, you might call it, right. And, you know, and but there's it's funny when you think about our name, and the name is somewhat intentional, right? Scale, right? They build crazy, gigantic things. Mm. So yeah, we showed that in the trailer, and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be amazing. Brandon, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was gonna say. Now that he says that it's it's not uh, as close to Monster Hunter as we expected, um, it actually reminds me a lot of Xenoblade. Um, how how open world Xenoblade is, and and uh, just how big it is. And if you look at the trailer for uh, the later Xenoblade uh, Chronicles, that's kind of what Skullbound uh, puts me in the mindset of. So if it's, it's something like that, man, I, I think it definitely could be one of the best games of all time. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to X as well. Yeah, Xenoblade was great. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. The next one is on my uh, anticipated list as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I think it's going to be a great year for Microsoft fans. Um, anybody doubting that you, you're not going to have an amazing year on Xbox One, you would be a fool to doubt that, especially after Ken said that Scale Bow is special and going to be huge. So sometime last year, Phil made a comment stating that 2015 lineup is crazy and so packed that he may have to move games to 2016. You have to know it brought a smile to every Xbox One fan's <laughs> face and, and Twitter was just going crazy um, in almost every forum. I'm sure you know what's coming, but we are concerned that Xbox One is a holiday console. Will we see any exclusive games released in the first or second quarter of this year? And without naming any games, are there any big titles releasing before summer? And one last question for you. If you could make a new IP, what would you create? Okay, so uh, I think, you know, A, it's important to understand that uh, part of the film philosophy again and the way <laughs> studios work, we don't target a month. We mm-hmm. do take our big games and we want them in holiday. Mm. Um, but we don't avoid spring, as an example. We do have um, both Ori, which is phenomenal. Right. You know, right. it's coming out uh, soon. I think it's February or March. I, I don't know the exact date. I'm sorry. And we've got uh, Scream Ride, which is actually kind of insane insanity. Right. It's the only way to describe it. You build and crush roller coasters. It's, I, I'm in love with the game. Um, we've got a couple other things that are coming out before the fall that haven't been announced yet. So I, without announcing, just know that, yeah, we have some stuff uh, after. Uh, I also don't know the date for Scream Ride. Sorry, I'm not a portfolio dude. <laughs> I know we have Ori and Scream Ride announced and coming before summer. And then we've got a couple other things that are before the big games that we've announced in the fall mm-hmm. that I think people will be uh, excited and surprised when they hear what those are. Um, and we also have games, to Phil's earlier point, we have games that are already planned for spring 2016. And the discussion is around, uh, because again, we don't really set date the way you know you might think, there are some things in the fall that may or may not finish in time for fall mm. and how those move around will then determine which things maybe in addition go to spring. And if, 
if a couple of big things move into each other, then something goes, right? Right. So I think that's what he was alluding to, but yeah, it's a, it's, I think, um, and I love talking to you guys. I mean, it'd be fun to talk after E3 and then maybe talk in the spring again next year. Oh, about, yes. We, we would love, we would to love that. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> going to have, have you. Cool. That, that kind of, hey, now I know what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of great stuff coming. And again, it just to speak as a gamer, it's it's across all platforms. And I think that's also what Phil was alluding to. Mm-hmm. It's a strong year for us. It's a strong year for Sony. It's a strong year for Nintendo. And, you know, it's, I always play iOS, and I love games on Steam. And so, I mean, there's lots of stuff to play more than ever. It, it's just a great time to be a gamer. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Ken, with, with that uh, answer, I want to know, uh, does the third-party releases um, – does that factor into when you might release a exclusive game? So some of the big ones, yes. Uh, again, we do this for each other, right? Mm-hmm. Again, I think it's pretty obvious if you just look at the history that other games don't ship the same week as Call of Duty. And other games tend to not ship the week that a big Halo game ships. Mm-hmm. And that's because we, you know, it's, it's, this is completely outside of studios, but we have a third-party group that helps the thir- big third parties uh, kind of understand, hey, here's where our big stuff is coming and then everybody tries to set up their stuff so it at least gets a week or two of uh, breathing room. Wow. You know, because you wouldn't necessarily want to have, hey, look at this week where, you know, nine AAA games come out. That happened this year across platform, and it was kind of, <laughs> right, the early, that week in early November when... Yeah, like, November was heck. Where my stack of shame grew. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have one of those as well. <laughs> yeah. Still catching up from, from last fall. Yeah, so I'm am I. GTA. I promise yeah, I'm gonna come same back. Same here. Same here. <laughs> that's that's crazy. So your your last question, if I could make a new IP, what would I create? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a hard question because I I kind of get to do the games I like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very interested in. Uh, um, and again, please don't take this as an announce. It's not right. But I am interested in mobile, and not three lane MOBA. But there's some there are some interesting things to the MOBA design that I feel scale in interesting ways mm-hmm. to any genre. And so one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, how that could impact whatever an RPG, you know, anything that's got some multiplayer to it. A- another thing I like, and this is partially where Phantom Dust came from, I do like the idea of um, how would I say this? So I, a part of my design philosophy is uh, two things. One, uh, and it sounds like a simple statement, but, but I, I believe it seriously. My job in the past was, quote, easy. All I had to do was make games that were super fun. Right. Not that that's easy, but, you know, that was, that was kind of the goal. Now we live in a world where you have to build a game that's super fun and it's watchable. Mm. And what I mean by that is, less scripted, right? If you, if you think about the games that get watched a lot on Twitch or YouTube, the games that people socialize and play and talk about for months or years as opposed to weeks, it tends to be games that are include a little bit more emergent gameplay and where if you watch somebody play and then you watch someone else play the same thing, it kind of looks and feels different. So that's something that I'm commenting and suggesting into all the games that we're working on. Right. And I think that, you know, that if there was a new IP, I would want to focus it really tightly at, hey, can you make something where when everybody, anybody plays it, it's, it's kind of different. So less scripted and more, um, uh, I'll, I'll take something that the, the Crackdown team likes to say, you know, a, a physics chemistry set. Where you just mix stuff together and cool happen. You know, that, that, that is uh, kind of the future of great game design, I believe. And so that, I'd put that into this kind of, it's not just if I could, it's kind of, no, this is the stuff that I'm thinking about a lot and talking to all the teams about is what would it mean to try and make things more watchable. The second piece to that is also in the past, especially console games, suffered from what I might give a bad phrase to, um, I'm not playing this game unless I have 20 minutes or more. That was a way to describe most console games in the past. Hmm. The reality is I tend to play a lot of games, especially on mobile, for a, I'm happy to go play for three minutes. Right. So I don't want to design a game that's made up of a bunch of little three-minute things, but I think more of our games need to be aware that 
if somebody turns the game on and they got five minutes, there should be something that they should be able to do that matters. I, I call it everything counts. You know, that I want to be able to go in and if I got only five minutes, hey, let me go grind something for five minutes. Let me go try and find some new place that I can tag and go to later. Let mm -hmm. me do other things that are maybe outside the, I'm going to go in the dungeon and play 45 minutes or I'm going to get together with friends and go on a crazy raid. You know, and some games have done this really well um, and some not so much. I mean, I'll, I'll call out a third-party game that I love. You know, Far Cry 4 was one of my favorite games in the fall. And it does a great job of, hey, I can just turn this thing on and I'm going to go hunting. And I'm going to go try and take out one outpost. i got ten minutes. I can go do those two things. Or I'm going to go try and take out one of the crazy strongholds, or I'm going to go move the story forward. I'm going to sit for three hours. The reality is that a lot of times I'll turn something on knowing I can play for five minutes, and then I play for an hour. But if it's a game that I know the only thing I can do to progress takes more than 20 minutes, to use the same example, then I might not turn it on because... It, it feels like this weird blocker of, eh, if, I don't, if I turn it on, I have to play for at least 20 to 40 minutes. Yeah. So, I mean, those two things match together, super watchable and playable in different amounts of time. Mm -hmm. I would wrap those into what new IP stuff should I create. Again, I think it's most games should be thinking about those things. I talk to about it with our partners all the time. That, that, that fits into answering that question. I think one of the things that Xbox fans love and, and, and it's just no slight at any other console. I think that we love the fact that when we get the games and the games that we see is the games that we get. You know, when we see gameplay, that's what we get. You know, we, we're not seeing CGI cutscenes too often. Usually when we see gameplay of a, of a, of a game that, that's coming out for the Xbox One platform, or, any, or even back in the day, even for the Xbox 360 platform, um, you saw those games and they were playable on the stage and then you got home and they were playable when you got home you know and i think that's really special and i think microsoft should continue to do that they shouldn't have to settle for hey here's this cg this cgi game or this rendered game and then you get home and this people think it's a downgrade you know getting the games that you see when they're announced knowing that they're going to be exclusive to your platform because xbox fans love exclusive titles and getting home and playing that game is something that is very special to us and, and Microsoft needs to continue. Cool. Yeah, I, thank you. We will. That's just awesome. You guys have any last words? Yeah, uh, I'll go first. Uh, Ken, I just I have to ask, um, since you worked with Nintendo for so long, and uh, you've probably, um, if you didn't touch this game, probably have, have played it, Eternal Darkness. Um, it's one of those games I, I think was ahead of its time, and um, I know they were trying to kickstart that game and bring it back. Is that something you would ever consider taking a look at and, and bringing to a Microsoft platform? So they own the IP, so it would be hard. <laughs> I don't think my, Nintendo would give us the IP for Eternal Darkness. But yeah, I, I love Eternal Darkness. And you know, again, just to be open and honest, it's why we went to go work with Dennis on Too Human was because that we were so impressed with uh, Eternal Darkness. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, Henry, who you spoke to about Spark, right. and, you know, and, yeah, he and worked on it too. Big, yeah, he, he was the designer at Nintendo uh, on Eternal Darkness, mm -hmm. and you know that that worked out so well. He went and actually worked for Dennis for a while, um, and so yeah, I love Eternal Darkness, and yeah, I helped some. It was mostly Henry, but you know at the time Henry worked for me, so, <laughs> so I was making the same kind of comments, take them or leave them. May the rats eat your eyes. You know, one of, <laughs> one of the best scenes ever in a video game. That crazy guy in the in the prison cell. Yeah. That, that speech he did, just go crazy goosebumps at the time. Yeah, I, yeah, big fan. Mike? Yeah, my question would be, you got any new info or updates on Crackdown that you could possibly divulge? Um, no, other than it's going exceptionally <laughs> well, and stuff blows up really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 guess, I guess what we're saying is cloud, the Cloud Gen guys, those are the people that's working on the game, correct? Yeah, Dave Jones' company. Right. So, you know, everybody is all hopped up on the cloud and, and, and the physics and things like that. So I guess these you saying things blow up really well. That means that it actually is, is working. People should look forward to seeing what the cloud can actually do when it comes to Crackdown because this is going to be the premier game for, for cloud compute. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Show it to the point. Can't give up too, too much info on that. Well... You know, again, Ken, man, we want to thank you for the opportunity 
and allowing us to continue to be the voice of the fans and uh, hope that you uh, return later in the year, you know, for retrospect on, you know, basically what we talked about um, at this show. Like you said, maybe after E3 or maybe a little bit later around the holiday season. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. I mean, I love the podcast and you guys are obviously kind of like me, sincere fans of the genre. It's it's fun to talk to you guys. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so no problem, man. Well, that's it for our show. Tick wants to thank all of you who have stopped in to listen, and we hope as vague as some of the answers may have been, you come away knowing that the Xbox One is going to have a big year in 2015 and a great generation. Knowing that Scalebound is going to be a big IP and one of the best Kamiya-san has ever made, think Devil May Cry action and open world with dragons. Phantom Dust has a single player with a 30-hour campaign. No battle toes this year, but talks of a reimagining of Perfect Dark into a third person action adventure, and we'll see some of the rare games we spoke of sometime this generation. Jeff Force Gemini on Xbox One? Wow. So again, we hope you were able to get your voices heard, your questions asked and answered, and you subscribe and stick with us for more awesome news, podcasts, interviews, reviews, and pod shots. Follow us on Twitter. Twitch, where we do giveaways for our subscribers, Facebook, Instagram, and you can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Windows Phone, and make us your podcast for Xbox One. Peace. For the fans, by the fans.